In this video, I present a version of the solo model that is augmented by human capital. This video is based on the papers by Menke, Roma and Weil, a contribution to the empirics of economic growth, which appeared in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 1992, by Psacharopoulos and Patrinos, Returns to Investment in Education, a decennial review of the global literature, which appeared in Education Economics in 2018, and a nice textbook treatment is again uh, found in the book by David Weil, Economic Growth, the third edition. From the previous videos, we know that the solo model explains many stylized facts of economic growth rather well from a qualitative perspective. So for example, that there is rather constant long-run economic growth in richer countries, which is driven by technological progress that there are convergence phases after wars or catastrophes, and persistent differences in income levels can also be explained by differences in parameter values such as investment or saving rates. However, the problem is that the quantitative predictions of the solo model are not in line with the data. So cross-country differences in saving rates, if we hold everything else uh, fixed, can only explain a small portion of the cross-country differences in living standards that we observe in reality. And the solar model predicts a convergence rate that is much faster than the convergence rates that can be found empirically. Now in this chapter, if we recall the modeling cycle, we again, we tested the model by the empirical uh, analysis, by empirical data, by confronting it with the data. And we found out that in some aspects it performs rather well, but in others it does not perform so well. So in this modeling cycle, we wouldn't scrap the model altogether, but we would extend it. And the extension that we look at here in this uh, chapter is to introduce human capital. And we will see that this leads to better quantitative predictions of the model. Now, what is human capital? Now, the basic insight here is that it's not the sheer number of workers that matters for uh, economic uh, output and for per capita GDP, but it's the productivity of individuals as determined by their education, health, experience, and other things that are um, embodied, basically. Now, as physical capital, human capital can be accumulated, so one can invest in the accumulation of human capital, one can extend schooling or go to university and so on, that increases education and via this channel human capital. One can also improve health by exercising a lot, going to medical checkups, regularly eating well, um, uh, quit smoking and, and things like that. Um, and of course, experience um, accumulates over the life cycle and also that adds to human capital. So it can be accumulated and one can invest in it. It is productive, so one can use human capital to produce something else. And it depreciates in its use, as we all know only too well. And it is rival in its use, which is also similar to physical capital. So if I uh, use uh, the education that I've acquired for something, then I cannot use it at the same time for a different uh, purpose, except if I'm very well in multitasking, which I'm not. So um, that's uh, basically the similarity to physical capital. But in contrast now to physical capital, human capital is embodied. So it uh, cannot be sold on the market basically. I can use it and I can get a wage for the human capital that I accumulated, but I cannot sell part of my human capital to somebody else. In the following, we focus on education in terms of uh, schooling or a university degree, and we abstract from investments in health and uh, accumulation of experience and so on. But I will later on um, allude to uh, effects that could emerge out of investments in health and experience. But anyway, the investment in education is typically seen as the most important determinant of human capital. And the question that we want to answer in the first part of this video is to which extent we can explain cross-country income differences by means of the differences in formal education that we observe across countries. 
And these differences that we observe across countries are illustrated here by means of a world map that is taken from the website Our World in Data, which uh, I can highly recommend to anybody who is interested in uh, cross-country data uh, on the determinants of uh, living standards, education, health, and so on and so forth, and particularly also on um, differences over uh, time. So this website is really uh, rich and a huge effort has been put into it by the developers of uh, this uh, database, in particular Max Rosa and his uh, co-authors. And there in this map, we see that some countries have much higher human capital levels if we measure human capital by years of schooling. And some countries have a much lower level of human capital. So the ones with the highest level of human capital as measured by years of schooling are in Northern America, Northern Europe, not so much Southern Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea. And then, uh, of course, if we get to uh, middle income countries, um, education is less in Southern Europe, um, parts of Asia, then also in Northern America, Southern America, and it's uh, least close to the equator in many African countries and also in some um, Asian uh, countries. So these differences that we observe we would like to see how much these differences explain in differences in living standards across uh, countries. In this table, I've um, summarized some selected countries and their mean years of schooling as of 2017. And we see that there is a huge variation. For example, in France, mean years of schooling was at 11.5 years. In Germany, it was uh, higher at 14.1 years. Nepal had a very low level of education in term, measured in uh, mean years of schooling of 4.9, Nigeria 6.2, Uganda 6.1, and then again two countries with a comparatively high um, level of education, the United Kingdom with close to 13 years and the US with 13.4 years. Again, the data from uh, the Our World in Data website, in particular the uh, Global Education chapter written by Max Rosa and Esteban Ortiz Ospina. Since uh, differences in education levels themselves do not really tell us anything yet about the human capital level of a country, we want to combine the differences in the mean years of schooling now with estimates of the return on education that have been described in the literature. And here this paper by Psacharopoulos and Patrinos from 2018 comes in handy because it is a survey of many different studies that estimated returns on investment in education at a microeconomic perspective by means of Minsarian wage regressions. So what they did was to look at wage data and regress it on the years of schooling of the different people in the sample, plus many additional control variables. And what they found was that each year of primary education was associated with a 7.8% uh, increase in wage for each additional year. In case of secondary education, the increase was 10.5% per each additional year. And in case of tertiary education, 12.9% on average across all the studies that they analyzed. Now, these mm, rates of return are actually rather high. So investments in human capital seem to be um, paying off to some extent. And now we can use these returns together with the cross-country differences in education levels to construct a human capital level that we can then use in the um, production function of a human capital augmented solo model to try to quantify the extent to which human capital contributes towards explaining income differences. As the production function, we assume a simplified version of the one that Men, Q, Roma and Weil use in the influential 1992 article. And the reason for using a simplified version is that for explaining cross-country income differences, the simplified version um, 
yeah, comes in more handy, so it's less cumbersome to work with it, and it has a more direct interpretation as well. And in this case, for cross-country income differences, um, we assume that human capital itself stays constant and does not accumulate anymore. We just use the observed differences across countries to explain income differences. And the production function here assumes that final output is produced with, again, um, productivity measured or expressed by A, physical capital with an output elasticity of alpha, and labor with an output elasticity of 1 minus alpha. But now we do not uh, <clears throat> have only raw labor. Instead, we have average human capital H that multiplies with the number of workers in the country. And if we use this product here, that would be the aggregate human capital stock. And here the assumption is, uh, in the simplified version, that the elasticity of output with respect to aggregate human capital is 1 minus alpha. With this, we can again very easily compute per capita or per worker output as aggregate output divided by the number of workers in the economy. That's again denoted by a lowercase y. And that's the aggregate production function divided by the number of workers such that it is productivity multiplied by human capital per worker to the power of 1 minus alpha and physical capital per worker to the power of alpha. Now with that per capita output or per worker output, we get the modified fundamental equation of the solar model in the presence of human capital. And that's the accumulation of capital per worker. Now again, as the investment rate or saving rate multiplied by output. So that's what is invested in the economy, gross investment. And that's what depreciates of the capital stock per worker uh, and what dilutes because of population growth. So we have um, delta plus uh, n times k. And uh, here uh, we see already the implicit assumption that uh, there is no technological progress. So also productivity differences stay constant over time and productivity does not uh, change over time. Now at the steady state, we have that the capital stock per worker does not accumulate anymore. So its change is equal to zero, which means that gross investment is exactly as high so as to cover uh, depreciation and capital dilution. So on the right hand side, we have that the first term and the second term are of equal size. So we have that gross investment is equal to depreciation plus capital dilution. And again, we denote steady state um, variables with an asterisk. And now from that, we just by simply reformulating um, and isolating uh, the capital stock per worker at the steady state on the left hand side, we can compute capital per worker at the steady state as a positive function again of the saving rate negative function of the rate of depreciation and capital dilution. The intuition behind these two dependencies was clear also from the solar model that we had previously. So if more is invested in the economy, of course, steady state capital stock uh, would be higher. But if the depreciation rate and capital dilution rate are higher, then the steady state capital stock would be lower. And if productivity is higher, that also means that capital per worker at the steady state would be higher. But now we have an additional turn here, and that's human capital per worker, where we see that if human capital per worker is higher, so would be physical capital per worker at the steady state. And the reason is clear from the production function. If human capital is higher, then we have a certain degree of complementarity between human capital and physical capital. So it would also pay off to invest in physical capital. So physical capital accumulation would also be um, higher because uh, this increase in human capital increases the marginal value product of physical capital. So now we can plug in the steady state capital stock per worker into the production function uh, in per worker terms. And we get this expression here for the steady state output per worker. Now, if we raise this expression here to the power of alpha, as we do because of the definition of per capita GDP here, then we get this expression where this human capital stock per worker from uh, the expression of capital per worker at the steady state is then raised to the power of alpha. And here we have human capital per worker from the production function to the power of one minus alpha. So if we summarize these two terms, we get human capital to the power of one because the exponents here add up. 
And then we have this term here. Uh, here we could also simplify again the productivity terms, but it's not necessary because the thought experiment that we do is that we again assume that um, everything here is the same across two countries, so it cancels out when we divide the income levels of the two countries as we see here. So we assume that country one and country two do not differ in any of these parameters that we have here, but they differ in their human capital per worker. So country one has a higher human capital per worker than country two. So if we divide their per capita GDP levels or per worker GDP levels, we get that the difference is H1 over H2. So it's exactly expressed by the differences in their human capital levels. Now, the interesting thing here is that um, had we used the production function directly without computing steady state physical capital, then the difference would only be determined by differences in human capital from the first human capital stock here that is raised to the power of 1 minus alpha. So if we divide the two expressions here, everything drops out except human capital of country 1 and country 2, but now raised to the power of 1 minus alpha. So now the exponent here is less than the exponent here, and the effect of human capital would be lower in explaining cross-country income differences. And why is this the case? Exactly what we have seen on the previous slide, namely that um, the differences in human capital between two countries also induce differences in physical capital stocks per worker across countries, even for identical saving rates, identical productivity, and uh, all other parameters uh, that are identical. And therefore, if we disregard the indirect effect that uh, differences in human capital have on physical capital accumulation, we would get a lower effect of human capital on cross-country income differences. And basically, we would make an error because the general equilibrium effect that we look after is exactly the one that we have here. Now we assume that we compare two countries, a high income country with 13 years of schooling on average, that's country one, and a low income country with six years of schooling on average, that's um, country two. We normalize the human capital stock without any education to unity, which means that each additional year of education leads to an increase in wages or in productivity above this um, normalized level of one. Then we assume that primary education lasts for four years, secondary education for six years, and tertiary education is everything above. And we use the parameters estimated by Psaharopoulos and Batrinos in 2018, averaged over all of the studies that they present, to calculate the human capital levels. Now in country one, that means that we have First, the 7.8% of return of each year of primary education, where we have four years, the first four years and the 13 years. Then we multiply that by the 10.5% of uh, return on education for secondary uh, schooling. For the six years that secondary schooling lasts, these are the next six years and the 13 years. And then we have three more years of tertiary education with a rate of return of 12.9%. Altogether, if we multiply that out, we get an um, effect of 3.54, by which average education is higher in this country than in the case when no education was uh, present. And in country two, we have also four years of primary education. So we have the same term as uh, here uh, for the first term. But then we only have two years, two more years here of secondary education and no tertiary education. On average, so um, if we multiply that out, we get a factor of 1.65. Therefore, if we divide per capita income in country one by per capita income in country two, according to the formula that we derived on the previous uh, slide, then we get that country one should be um, should have a higher income than country two by a factor of 2.16. So we've seen education explains another part of cross-country income differences, apart from differences in investment rates and saving rates that we had in the basic version of the solo model and the previous chapter on the solo model and the data. However, we have that the quality of education is still disregarded. For example, the education of teachers or the quality of teaching material. 
And it's also disregarded that attendance is usually lower in low income countries. And also other dimensions of human capital have so far been neglected, such as health and experience. On top of that, one would also expect that there are externalities of human capital that are not um, included in the measures that we used so far and do not appear in the differences in per capita GDP across countries as we have calculated. So, for example, if there is a teamwork, then more educated um, workers also raise the productivity of other team members, for example, or the effect that well-educated workers often work in the research and development sector and thereby raise productivity, which we will see in later videos. Now we can also uh, try to incorporate these aspects and then the difference in the human capital stocks between high income countries and low income countries would be even higher. And this is exactly what we do next when we combine physical capital differences that are induced by differences in investment or saving rates and differences in human capital that are driven by differences in education. Again, we compare a low income country versus a high income country. And we've already seen in the previous uh, chapter on the solo model and the data, the differences in investment or saving rates explain differences in income levels of a factor of two between the two uh, countries. Now, in the previous slides, we've seen the differences in human capital as driven by differences in education explain a factor of a little bit more than two. Now, if we take into account differences in the quality of education between high income and low income countries, as well as differences in health across uh, these two countries, then differences in human capital can easily explain a difference in income levels up to a factor of three. Now, if we combine these two, that means that both together differences in physical capital as driven by differences in investment rates and differences in human capital as driven by differences in education, including the quality of education, can then explain a factor of six in terms of income differences across countries. Now that's of course much larger than the differences we could explain so far, but nevertheless, we recall that the observable differences uh, between high income and low income countries are up to a factor of 30 and more. So the bottom line, therefore, is that physical capital and human capital together explain already a sizable part of the differences that we observe across countries in terms of uh, income levels, but by far not everything. And the rest is explained basically by differences in productivity that can again be decomposed into differences in technology and differences in efficiency across countries, which we will see in later videos. Before we do this, however, we now turn to the original Mankiw Romo Weil model in the not simplified version, where we relax the assumption that human capital stays constant over time and instead assume that human capital is also accumulated as is physical capital. And again, <clears throat> as in the standard solo model, we assume that technological progress is labor augmenting and we follow the production function specification of the original article by Mankiw, Roma, and Weil. And this production function looks as follows. We have that final output is produced with physical capital with an output elasticity of alpha, human capital with an output elasticity of eta, and effective labor, so productivity multiplied by the number of workers, with an output elasticity of one minus alpha minus eta, where again, um, we have a Cobb Douglas specification, so 1 minus alpha minus eta is greater than 0, and the exponents add up to 1. Now, if we divide this by the efficiency units of labor, AL, we get the intensive form production function, so output per unit of effective labor, as capital per unit of effective labor to the power of alpha times human capital per unit of effective labor to the power of eta. So that's easily seen again if we divide this expression here by A times L. Then we have to recognize that now output can be invested in two types of capital, in physical capital and in human capital. 
So we have an accumulation equation that looks like this here. We have on the left hand side the accumulation of both types of physical capital. And we have here gross investment in terms of both types of physical capital. And here we have uh, depreciation and capital, effective capital dilution of both types of capital. And then we have a no arbitrage relationship that states that investment in both types of capital should yield the same rate of return because otherwise uh, rational investors would only want to invest in those uh, capitals in, in that capital stock that leads to the higher rate of return on investment so what we have here is that um, investments in physical capital where the rate of depreciation is delta and we assume the same rate of depreciation in um, human capital and investments in human capital yield to the same rate of return, but the rate of return is here the intensive form production function divided by um, capital per unit of effective labor here for the rate of return on capital and human capital per unit of effective labor for the return on, of the human capital. And in front, we have the output elasticity of the corresponding capital stock. So this has to hold in equilibrium if the two types of investment deliver the same rate of return, which they would in an equilibrium because otherwise rational investors would only want to invest in the other capital stock. Now from this uh, relationship, we can then infer that there is a fixed ratio between human capital per unit of effective labor and physical capital per unit of effective labor because the rate of depreciation drops out. The output per unit of effective labor drops out and then we can just express one of the capital stocks in terms of the other and here we have human capital per unit of effective labor expressed in terms of physical capital per unit of effective labor and the ratio theta divided by alpha. Now this can be used to eliminate human capital per unit of effective labor in the fundamental equation here and express everything in terms of capital per unit of effective labor. And they are a bit tedious calculations, but after they are done, what we would have is that the evolution of capital per unit of effective labor, again, depends on gross investment in physical capital minus depreciation and effective capital dilution in terms of um, physical capital here. And this B parameter, that would be a parameter here, actually, um, is a parameter cluster eta to the power of eta, alpha to the power of one minus eta divided by alpha plus eta. But again, it looks very similar to the standard solo model that we already know very well. And the analysis of the model is also very similar. So we can draw a diagram and we have convergence and we have differences in the steady state, uh, steady states driven by differences in parameter values and so on and so forth. And we've already seen that the model is then better in explaining cross-country income differences because there is a second source of income differences, namely differences in human capital across countries. So that we've already seen. But what we have not seen so far, and which requires actually that the cap human capital stock is also allowed to accumulate, is that the speed of convergence also changes. And in the mancu roma weil model, the speed of convergence is actually given by 1 minus alpha minus eta times n plus the rate of technological progress or productivity growth plus the rate of uh, depreciation. Now, in case of the solo model without human capital, we did not have the eta term here. The rest was equal. And now we again use reasonable parameter values. So an output elasticity of capital of one third, population growth rate of 1%, growth rate of productivity or technological progress of 1% per year, and a rate of depreciation of 5%. But now in addition, we have this parameter eta that we can also plug in and reasonable estimates of eta also circle around the value of one third. Now, if we plug all that in, we would get a rate of convergence of 2.3%. And now that is remarkably close to the empirical estimates that we've already discussed in the previous chapter on the solar model and the data that range between 2 and 2.5%. 
So overall, we see that accounting for human capital in the solo model is indeed very reasonable. It leads to predictions, to better predictions of the model for cross-country income differences and also for better predictions with respect to the speed of convergence. So if we again recall the modeling cycle, we made another step of improvement of the whole framework for explaining cross-country income differences and explaining long-run economic growth. And this improvement actually now leads to a situation where the model not only explains qualitatively well uh, certain stylized facts, but also comes closer to explaining them um, quantitatively well. However, we are not yet fully uh, there because there is still, as we've seen, an income difference between the different countries that is as of yet unexplained. And the next chapter, next video, will deal with another source or two other sources actually of cross-country income differences that explain the bulk of the rest that is still to be explained.